started streaming. Uh-oh. 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 What's up, everyone? This is a, uh, this is going to be a, a big one here. Um, doing a whiteboard episode, which I have not done. I was just telling Tom, he's like, since I, before I've been here, I said, no, it's been two years at least since I did an actual whiteboard episode. Uh, welcome everyone on Saturday. In case you hadn't watched my new channel trailer, I put it out yesterday. I got sick of the one that's been on my channel since the very beginning in 2016, and uh, I got sick of seeing it. And it's basically a compilation of of interviews that I did up until um, 2022 or so. So the, those of you that say, "Hey, where are all the new ones with with Nuno and and um, uh, Dominic Miller and?" And Ingve and everybody like that. I have, those were I did not put those in yet. But um, <clears throat> so a uh, uh, couple things. We've got um, the uh, bundle sale, and we're going to be talking about stuff, music theory stuff that is in my Beato book interactive, which is a video course. All my courses are video courses or. My ear training course is actually a video course and it has programs with hundreds of training modules to help develop your ear better than my Quick Lessons Pro and my beginner guitar course. Uh, some of the, uh, a lot of the chords in here are actually in my beginner guitar course with, with the exception of some of the dissonant chords that Jimmy Page uses. Um, but um, I want to also remind people, I've got a second channel, Rick Beata 2, and I know that you've seen things. I have some original videos that are on there, and I do clips from some of my interviews. Some of the interviews, like Daniel Lanois, are three hours long, and people could never see them, so I snip out parts of them and put them on my second channel. And I have original, plenty of original content on there, so subscribe to Rick Beata 2. All this stuff is in the uh, description below. Um, Okay, so before I play Led Zeppelin here, and I don't know if Led Zeppelin is going to get me blocked or not, uh, I'm going to play this version of it because this version, uh, just to show you the difference between the Led Zeppelin and this, which I love this version. Um, okay, this is a Tori Amos version. This was on her EP. Um, so she does it in the key of she starts on A we're going to talk about the keys no inverted chords So she's doing all straight uh, root position chords, whereas Led Zeppelin does not do that, which I will show you here. And then it goes F sharp minor to B. Okay, now let's check out the actual version of the song, which is of Zeppelin II. So this song uh, is what I would call a very classic Mixolydian song. We'll talk about the theory. This is um, these are the type of things I like breaking down because of this um, the the way that the chord progression works. Now this Mixolydian chord progression, I'll play it from the beginning. Um, it starts with the one chord. Would Jimmy play it on the twelve string? So, it's in D. So the chord progression in the verse per period uh, part is D to C to G over B or G. I love these lyrics and this melody. It's a perfect melody. Still be you and me. Then it goes to B minor. 
Eve. E A. Then. Okay. So what is it doing here? What are these chords? And why do I call this a mixolydian chord progression? Well, one of the reasons is, oh, this is so fun. I love this stuff here. For those of you that haven't seen a whiteboard uh, video, this is a whiteboard video. So if we start, you guys tell me if you can see or not. We have a D major chord, C major. Then we have G over B right now if we were to analyze this as if it were the key of g this would be the one chord the five chord and the four chord okay but the ear hears this as being in oh wow that looks kind of weird right ear hears this as being in d because you come back to it but if i were to play the scale that goes with it Mixolydian is the rock and roll uh, uh, chord uh, mode. Notice it got that nice sharp four on that C chord. It's obviously in D, right? So if it's in D, then this is the one chord here. This is not really the five chord. Okay? So this is one to flat seven major, uh, and then the G would be the four chord, okay? So that's why I call this a mixolydian chord progression, all right? Uh, let's talk about mixolydian for a second. What is this mode? If you're in the key of D mixolydian, what are the notes of D mixolydian? D mixolydian is a major scale with a flat seven. So D, E, F sharp, G, A, B, C. It's actually a G major scale starting on D. It's the five chord in the key of G. But in this case, it's acting as a one chord. Now, the confusing thing about this, right? So on this uh, second chord here, you got the sharp four. The first chord has the sus four and the sus two on it. Jimmy's using that as color tones on this G major or B, he's using the major seven. That's what gives it all its beauty, right? Are these beautiful uh, dissonances and, and um, gives it kind of a majestic feel. But then when it goes to the pre-chorus, it goes to B minor and then E. And it's like, okay, well those chords are kind of, you could say those are in D, but then you hear the E chord, the B minor's in D or G, but then you get that E major chord, that's definitely not in those keys, okay? When I hear that though, I'm hearing a two five, okay? Typically, so B minor and E, does that twice, right? Um, then it goes B minor, E, then A, okay? Well, there's our secret right there, this A chord here. This is the one chord. This is really a two, five, one, or two, five, two, five, one in the key of A, all right? Okay, so what does that mean exactly? So if we're in this key, uh, if you have the key of A here, the one chord is A major, the two chord is B minor, the three chord, C sharp minor. The four chord is D major. The five chord is E major. Six chord, F sharp minor, and then G sharp diminished. Okay, so two, five, one. So you go to the two chord, B minor, two, E major, B minor, E major, back to A major. Okay, we're definitely in that key there. And it sounds very different from the... Um, if I go from that, 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 and I go, you're like, well, that kind of sounds like it could be, could be the same key. Uh, uh, oh, okay, so that chord there is definitely not in the key. If I were to analyze this as if it were the key of G, 
you could say, oh, that's a secondary dominant, okay? Uh, but if you go further on in chord progressions, it, to know that you've modulated, you have to keep looking around. If it's an isolated chord, that B minor can be analyzed in the key of D, it would be the sixth chord, or in the key of, or I'm sorry, um, in, in the key of D, it would be the sixth chord. In the key of G, uh, the uh, B minor would be the three chord, okay? So we have this term, um, secondary dominant. Now you guys that have my Beato book, you see this, this term, secondary dominant. What is a secondary dominant chord? Well, a secondary dominant chord, I'm gonna put my guitar down for a second here, right on the board. A secondary dominant chord, you have your primary chords in a key. We're gonna talk about the next section. So the primary chords, uh, let's say in the key of G, this, we'll do this for an example. The primary chords would be G, A minor, just like it did in the key of D. B minor, C, D, E minor, F sharp, diminished, okay? These primary chords have Roman numerals. You guys that have been watching the channel for a long time know these Roman numerals. Capital Roman numerals are major chords. Lowercase Roman numerals are minor chords. And that seventh chord is a diminished chord. These are the primary chords in the key of G, okay? The secondary chords or the secondary dominant chords would be, for example, E major is the five of two. So it's the five chord of the two chord. E, um, F sharp major here is the five chord of the three chord. Uh, um, G is the five of four. Now all this stuff is clearly written in my book. Uh, G A major is the five of five. And then um, B major is the five of six. Okay, so you could say like, well, if I'm looking at this, I see this A major chord. That's a, if I say this is in the key of G, this would be five chord, four chord, one chord. And then you're like, well, that's the three chord. And this would be a, uh, a, a five of two, a five of two. Right? So you can analyze it in that key, but this is definitely, definitely a mixed linear thing. So these are secondary dominant chords. Why is it important to know that? Because these are the first chords typically that people use to um, add interest to their chord progressions, right? Beatles used them, everybody used them. As harmony started to expand in the uh, 1960s with songwriting, songwriters started to look beyond, I'm, we're talking like, you know, not Bob Dylan folk music, we're talking about when the Beatles and the Stones started doing things, you started getting these secondary dominant chords, right? So if I had a, a song like, um, um, uh, there are places I remember all my life. Some have changed. So, so, um, uh, in my life. So it starts out one, five, six. But then it goes to this chord. This is really an A7 chord over G. Okay, so we're in A, but then you get an A7. Okay, A7 is the five of the D chord that follows that. All right. So that is a secondary dominant chord, and it's a very sneaky one because you could say, oh, huh, what's that G doing in the bass? Because McCartney plays that in the bass. I think Le that's actually Lennon. Then it goes to a four minor to one, right? So when you start having songs like that that have these borrowed chords as a four minor chord, which would be a borrowed chord, as a secondary dominant chord, that A7 chord over G, this is when you start getting harmony that is uh, outside of the straight diatonic chords of a song. Okay, so the thing about the Zeppelin tune about Thank You is that it starts on the, uh, which would be the five chord in the key of G, but it's obviously in the key of D. And many songs use this Mixolydian chord progression. One major, flat seven major, 
Okay, so D, C flats, seven, then four to one. Now, here's the thing. So after it does this pre-chord, pre-chorus, Five, one, three, four, little drops of rain. Okay, then you're just like, whoa, that's kind of weird. Then it goes back to C to G over B. So it's really C to G. Da, da, da. So we've definitely changed keys again. Um, it's going back to that initial chord progression except this time around it starts on the c okay it starts on the flat seven this is what is so unique now these guys didn't necessarily know what they're doing actually i don't believe that because jimmy page was a session guitar player he knew what he was doing this is a page plant song he knew a two five progression two five one progression um but what i think that they were doing is um uh, the, this this mixolydian sound allows the use of blue notes, right? Of flat sevens, of, of flat thirds, things like that. It sounds more bluesy when you use this mixolydian chord progression. This is why ACDC did it all the time. So many ACDC songs uh, do this thing. They'll do it over pedals. If I played, you know... Uh, DC song uses these mixolydian, you know, you shook me on. A, let's, let's say, uh, what is it? You shook me on. A, oh, that's actually in G. Uh, um, what would be one that does, uh, um, What, what is it? Highway to Hell. It uses this deep mixolydian chord progression. Another one would be um, She Said, She Said, The Beatles. She said, I know what it's like to be dead. This thing is is this this uh, one flat seven to, five, uh, to four is all over rock and roll music. Okay. Okay, so what happens when it goes to the C chord here? Well, like I said, the C, right? So the verse here is this. This is the pre-chorus. Then the chorus, I guess you'd call this the chorus, is C, drops of rain, G over B. When I say G over B, that's just the first inversion G major chord. And then D for two bars, okay? So then it's four flats, uh, I'm sorry, uh, flat seven, ugh. Oh yeah, there you go. Flat seven uh, to four to one major, okay? It's cool, right? That it actually kind of reverses the chord progression. That This is what makes the song so interesting. Um, the thing, the, the reason I love Tori Amos's version is that she, plays different voicings there, right? She's um, She starts out and she plays a lot, a lot of root position chords. So in this verse, She doesn't go to D over F sharp. She goes right to D. And to me, okay, that's a subtle difference there. But if I'm going to reinterpret a song, change the key, I would, um, she's not going. She leaves that out. That's really a guitar riff. Now, she really could have played that in the piano. Um, but I love the interpretation of that. But to me, that uh, the majestic quality of this, uh, of Jimmy using the, uh, I love 
love that. That is what gives Led Zeppelin its Celtic feel, okay? Those, um, he uses this similar thing in Tangerine, right? When he uses those, uh, sorry. I just love those things, those majestic, right? The sus four, sus twos, the major, the Celtic feel of the music. Okay, so why is it important to know this stuff? Um, because to be a musician and really know uh, what you're hearing, because that's ultimately what this is about. What am I hearing? Like, what are those chords? Why isn't it just D to C to G? What are those things? What Do those things make a difference? They make a huge difference. The sus four to major to sus two. This is where music theory comes in and ear training. To be able to hear that and know what these things are. When I went to think of um, uh, the Beatles song I played in my life, I thought, okay, what? how's the song go? I hear it in my head. There are places I remember. My ear, I hear the melody right there. And then I, I started singing it and I sang it in the right key. Just then, before I played, I said, there are places I remember. Why did I sing in the right key? Because everything that I've played up until this point, I have all my key, I don't have perfect pitch, but I have all these key centers related to one another now. I'm using my ear. This is called relative pitch. This is how you tell that the verse goes one flat seven to four, and the pre-chorus does a two, five, one in the key of A, and that you've changed keys. And then when you go back up to C, little drops of rain, right? When you go to that, you know it's the flat seven to four, to one in, in the key of D major, D mixolydian, right? So ear training, this is why I developed my courses. This is why I wrote my uh, music theory book, is to teach you to know what you're hearing, know what these secondary dominant chords are. I was talking to Aaron, who happens to be over here off camera. He's here visiting. Howdy. Uh, so Aaron was, uh, we were talking about this, about the, uh, at Berkeley, Aaron went to Berkeley, so they, they'd use, they use the term, the secondary dominant term in this pre-chorus, you can see, the B minor to E. The E chord, where is it? Right there. The E chord there is a secondary dominant chord. Or it's a primary dominant chord. It's a regular dominant chord in this song in the key of A. But this term, uh, you could say, okay, well, if you're in the key of... of uh, if you're in the key of D, the A chord could be the five chord, right? In that case, that would be a five of five. And then the the two chord, the B minor seven would be a, uh, I said, well, that's like a, a supertonic, uh, secondary supertonic. Is that what I called it? Yeah. <laughs> secondary supertonic. That is not a term, but I'm thinking I might start using that. I might add that to the Beato book, uh, Secondary Supertonic. We call it twoing the five. You put a two chord before five chords. It's a very common thing to do. It's in a million uh, tunes from uh, jazz tunes. And, uh, and it's in a lot of the songs that Jimmy Page would have played as a session musician in England at the time. Um, and, and this is really important to understand this stuff because the things that inform the writing of these songs, right, and knowing, okay, these are good notes to use because Jimmy's guitar parts here, these things. Why does he use that note, that? It's because it's beautiful. And this chord here, whoops. That chord is beautiful. He didn't go, he didn't go. Because it's boring. You need to have these fills in here to create interest and, and those suspensions and things create the mood. That's what gives it that 
Celtic feel. And then to me, those things are what suggest melodies in the melodic direction that Robert Plant would take, right? Why would he choose the notes that he's choosing? Why would he choose the lyrics? I think that's even more important. Um, if you think about these, the, the, the imagery in the lyrics here, if the sun refused to shine, which it does in England all the time, it's refusing to shine here in Atlanta today, and it refused to shine the entire time I was in Germany. No offense to Germany. Berlin was great. If the sun refused to shine, because it definitely refused to shine, I would still be loving you. When the mountains crumble to the sea, there will still be you and me. King and woman, I give you all my, king and woman, nothing more. Little drops of rain, whisper of the pain, tears of love's lost in the days gone by. That is such, um, my love is strong. With you, there's no wrong. Together we shall go until we die. My, my, my. That is a super melancholy lyric that to me is brought on by these specific kind of voicings that Jimmy Page is using, okay? This is why uh, uh, you should really learn things like ear training and music theory. This is why I sell my courses like this, is to help you develop these things. This is why I've done these whiteboard lectures for the last seven years on this channel. Really, I haven't done it in the last two years. But we drag the whiteboard out because I think that the physical act of writing these things down and seeing them, visualizing them, it starts to, um, uh, I think it starts to ingrain these things in your mind when you see what the chord analysis is. You hear it and then you start recognizing this thing and bringing them in. And if you start study the beginning of my Beato book, the first things we do, we start with the circle of fifths, right? C, G, D, A, E, B, F sharp, D flat, A flat, E flat, B flat, F, and then back to C. We've, we learn that, and then we learn what notes are sharped, and flat, sharped or flatted in each key. C major has no sharps or flats. G major has one sharp, which is F sharp. D major has two sharps, which is F sharp, C sharp. A major has three sharps. And if you go back the other way, F major has one flat, B flat major has two flats, E flat major has three flats, A flat major has four flats. How do I know this? Because I've written it down a million times here. And one of the reasons that I wrote my Beato book initially was that I got sick of writing it down for my students. And then when we turned it into a video course here, we added the audio examples along with, so you have the, the uh, things that come up on the screen, right? That show you the, the, what, what each chord and the key are. And then it plays the things, right? So you can hear what the sound is. What is the difference? What, how do you know whether you're in the one chord, the four chord, or the five chord? Well, you do ear training. You start to recognize interval relationships between these chords, right? Am I hearing, I hear this. You hear that, da, then you hear the bass note go down, ba, then you know it goes down to this note, which is B. And how do I know that? Because I know da, da, da is down a whole step. So if I know the first note is D, when I hear da, da, I know down a whole step from D is the note C. I know da is down a half step from C to B, ba, right? And then when it goes to that, B minor chord. When it goes to that B minor chord, which is out of tune here, I recognize that that chord is a minor chord. It's not functioning as a G major chord, it's functioning as a B minor. And then the E major chord, I know this, I hear that chord, I'm like, okay, we're somewhere else. We're definitely somewhere else, we're in another key. How do we know what key we're in? So there's many different layers of this. There's the understanding of being able to figure out something by listening to it. That's ear training, okay? Uh, but in order to know what you're hearing, you have to know the theory of what you're hearing, right? So you have to be able to understand what intervals are. You gotta know what these uh, diatonic chords in a key are. Um, and to get these things, I sell all my stuff in the description below. You click on it, you go to myrickbeato.com, my bundle is 99 bucks and there's four courses for 99 bucks. It's the best deal out there of any of the, I'll say it myself. You don't get your money's worth anywhere that you do. You can buy other people's courses. 
up for 150 bucks for one course, or you can buy four of my courses for 99 bucks. Okay, if you're just learning the guitar and want to know how to strum, how to play open chords, how to play bar chords, how to play some of these suspended chords to learn these songs, you can learn it through the beginner guitar thing. If you're like, I already know all this stuff, I'm more of an advanced thing, you can go to my Quick Lessons Pro, where I do these lessons based on a lot of single note playing and using modes and th different things like that. Or if you're like, I want to be able to figure out chords like Rick does when he's doing his top 10 breakdown or when he's learning a Led Zeppelin song. I want to be able to figure the stuff out like that. That's your ear training course. But then the ear training course is married with the theory course. There is theory in the ear training course, but it's far more in depth in my Beato Book Interactive course. And this isn't a way to sell this stuff. This is a way for you to become a better musician and know what you're hearing. That is the most important thing to me. That's why I became a musician, I think. Um, I, I wanted to be able to figure out songs because when I was a kid, people were like, hey, do you know how to play this song? Uh, no. Uh, and it's like, once I learned, I got my ear training together, I could just think of the song and I could sound out what the chord progression. If I was doing that, the Beatles song, Places I Remember, I, I know instantly I could sound that out. I could sound out, you know, a hundred songs right now that I've never played before because uh, I know what the relationships between these things are. I know what the melody relationship to the chord is. I know what the chord relationship to each other is, and I know what the relationship of the bass notes. And the reason the bass notes are important is because when you get to this third chord there, you know that that's an inverted chord. So you have to be able to tell when a chord's in root position, first inversion, second inversion. If it's a four note chord, like a dominant chord, a third inversion, like in my life, it uses that chord. That's a third inversion dominant chord, okay? So you gotta be able to recognize these things. Am I hearing a sus four or a sus two? Am I hearing a first inversion chord or root position or a second inversion chord? Am I hearing a third inversion chord? Am I hearing a dominant chord with a flat nine or a sharp nine? If I hear this, you can say, oh, that's the Jimi Hendrix chord. Or you can say, yeah, it's a dominant sharp nine chord because that's really what the name of it is, right? You need the theory, you need the names to be able to do that, to be able to put the name to what you hear. Anyways, that's today's music theory slash ear training slash uh, uh, lecture on the importance of all this stuff. Uh, if you haven't gotten a chance to watch my video from yesterday, I really, really highly encourage you to watch it. It's a great, they're excerpts of, of a lot of my favorite quotes from interviews that I did up through last year. It's really, really fantastic, I think. It's my new channel trailer. And uh, don't forget to hit the subscribe button on Rick Beato 2. Open up another thing. After you buy the bundle, go over to Rick Beato 2, uh, my, my second year, uh, YouTube channel, which I've had for seven years, by the way. I started it four months after I started this channel. So it's not anything new. Anyways, you guys are amazing. Have a great rest of your weekend. And uh, we'll see you soon.